As I took time to put some words down for a sermon this week, as often happens by the end of it, I think I'm not sure who's written who. However, I come to the sermon thinking that where I get to is probably highly unrealistic and unlikely to look like it would stand up in real life. But then I look at how we celebrate this festival of Pentecost and I think how would this story hold up in real life as we understand it today. So I might be in reasonably good company. Well, as we see in Pentecost, we celebrate with red and yellow and orange swirling color, with song and candle, rushing wind, tongues of fire. Many and varied languages are spoken and heard. Spirit outpours upon the community that is gathered together in one place. This community, we might presume, were those who were directed to return to Jerusalem by the men dressed in white who appeared before the standing mouth agape disciples looking heavenward as Jesus ascended. The gathered together waiting with joy, faithfully worshipping and blessing God people. The way the story goes, the Easter, Eastertide, Ascension, and now Pentecost, Pentecost stories go, is that Jesus, who with hindsight we now say revealed God's presence in human form in the world, that Jesus was killed, was put to death. That's what we say at Easter. Perhaps an act of political espionage because if someone's revealing God can be present in human form, you'd better get rid of the evidence, just in case. Even so, afterward, something broke through. A figure that came to be recognized as Jesus by those who had known him, recognizable if changed. And before long, as the story goes, this Jesus, half known, mostly recognized, went from them was lifted up heavenward, they say, and Jesus' disciples, followers, supporters, men and women, were left to their bare bones reality in the aftermath. For some reason this year, that idea, that idea of being left to their bare bones selves, popped to mind that Ezekiel dry bones story, you know that. Dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones, dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones. Sorry, I sang that as a youngster, it always comes to mind. It was as if after the ascension, that bare bones community were being knit together as a body through the worship and blessing of God in the temple. And today, the Pentecost of violent wind, the breath of life, that enlivens this body of Jesus followers, enlivens that bare bones, sinew bound, flesh clad body of followers to be and to become and to step into being the body of Christ alive in the world. I wonder if this is why today we name sometimes this the birthday of the church and Diana's baked us a cake. The day that the church was brought, brought to birth in the world. It speaks of a community also in transition, as we are here. A time for us to gather and worship, full of thanks for this place, and to consider the good bones of St. Matthew's, and to open ourselves to receive and to learn, where the enlivening spirit of God is blessing and leading and sending us. I'm a little bit like those who heard the voices, many voices of Pentecost Day. What does it mean when this empowering spirit descends and blows? To what end does this happen? We stand in a story, as I've already said, that says that humans can express God's presence in the world. Can we actually get our heads around that, or maybe our hearts around that? What the implications and impact of such a thing might be on us? The effect on us? On what and who for and how we live? 
because it's telling us something about who we are that we can express divine priority in our life and in our work and in our being that we do. This poured out spirit is done, is poured out upon a gathered community. Each of them, on each of them, a divided tongue of fire dances. We gathered here are disciples. It is on all of us in this community, all in and of anyone who understands themselves as part of this community that are needed for us to fully express God blessing presence in and beyond this place. The unity of this community that Diana referred to last week is expressed in the difference and the diversity of tongues and how people speak and ears that comprehend all of these upon the Spirit is poured. Yet what is it that we are to say? What is it that we are to speak and to act and to influence for good in what seems a jaded, worn down, disrupted, bent on self-destruction world? With all due humility, thank you Alan from your prayers last week, with all due humility, will we acknowledge that our collective effort to change the world for the better isn't going so well? Except that doing the same thing that we have always done, even if we do it harder and faster, with the best and most noble will in the world, isn't changing anything much. If it were to, surely we'd have seen some sign of it by now. And to push this just a little bit further, do we ask whether Jesus coming and dying and resurrecting and spirit outpouring has changed anything much about the prevailing power structures of our world that diminish and demean? It certainly hasn't fulfilled our expectations of what is meant to happen if God is in charge. Are we missing something? What are we not seeing? The divine spirit blessing, blessing that is poured out at Pentecost upon those gathered is abundantly indiscreet. It doesn't check whether they've got it right or even if they have any much idea of what right looks like. It doesn't pause to ensure that everything is correct and in proper order and with the program much less ensuring that there's somebody on hand who has any idea what's happening. Divine life-bringing blessing comes and is poured out on us where we are in this broken, bleak jadedness of our world, on who we are, where we are, as we are. We do not have to be good enough or noble enough or committed enough to receive. But it is our choice whether we accept it, whether we choose to open ourselves for blessing. Can you imagine what our world would look like if we all stopped pretending we had to be someone or something we're not? If we let ourselves live present and experiencing our vulnerability, if we opened ourselves to receive the divine blessing poured into us, the divine blessing that others pour into us. The divine blessing that creation gives us with life every day. If we opened and stepped into that. Crazy idea. Crazy mad idea. Imagine living vulnerably. So unrealistic. I know, I told you, crazy idea. But let me share with you some stories I had out of conversations this last week or so. As you all know, there was a very bad flood event, an inundation of parts of the population of Tamaki Makara this last year. And people are still suffering and living with that. 
As part of the restoration and remediation process for those people worst affected, a number of public meetings have been convened. They've been held within each of the different most affected communities. In the conversation with people who had been a part of organising those meetings, they've commented, a number of them, about the marked and the stark difference of response between those communities to the situation they find themselves in. That's not unreasonable, of course, because they're different communities. But there are also some similarities. Those in the most vulnerable communities, who have little and now just about nothing, really come to those meetings, if ever, to complain. What they do do is they come and they say, how can we help? They can see what's caused the flooding and they want to know how they can help and how they can bring their communities with them to help fix things. Those who are in the communities of greater privilege, who've lost perhaps not their first or their second home, come looking to blame. Who did this and how can we get money from them to pay for it? Might it be that when we know we are vulnerable, we know we have to reach out. And when we reach out, we invite a collective engagement. It engenders a collective life. It releases resources from that community and it creates abundance. But when we have privilege, we tend to become self-reliant and self-dependent and we isolate and we protect ourselves, and so we withdraw from the reality of our collective dependence and how we can contribute. Today we're going to extinguish our Paschal candle. 50 days of Easter have now passed. But before we do this, we're going to light a smaller candle. We're going to light it from the Paschal candle, and we're going to carry it with us as we recess from the church. It is a symbol to us that it's us, it's you and I, who are now to join with those who also are light bearers in the world. We're going to take such trembling, flickering flame into the world, and we with others are going to nurture and feed and sustain the fire of divine blessing that permeates our world. Because it seems to me that it's in vulnerability and needfulness that we open to accept and entrust ourselves to the abundantly indiscreet overflowing spirit of God. And in so doing we open ourselves to our needs, to others, we hear and we respond. And in doing so, we release our resourcefulness for the world and for one another.